the small towns uh, that you know that are, that are kind of developed around uh, the law of the Indies. They come to the, they move to they went, they move to a suburb in the U.S. and they start to figure out they start to think how do I figure this place out? You know, it's not it's not Latin America at the plaza where I walk to. This is a, it's a suburb. So so a lot of Latinos are looking for these types of type, types of you know structures in the built environment and uh, one of the really fascinating things about it is how Latinos are retrofitting America's suburbs to make them a lot more sustainable and a lot and, and a lot healthier in their through their behavior patterns so I'll, I'll be looking at a kind of overview looking at a healthy Latino behavior patterns looking at mobility looking at physical activity looking at urban design and social and cultural context and how do we as Latinos do these do these things or how do how do the, what do they mean for us mobility Mobility is, mobility is critical. A lot of Latinos come from the U.S. with very few resources, so they tend to, they tend to walk. You know, walking is a big part of the Latino community, even even in a suburban neighborhood, even in Coachella, in the desert. We're walking everywhere. We we have some of the highest accident rates, but that's just what we do. And then you know, so this is this is Latino women, Latino women, you know, walking their kids to school. You know, very common, but and that's a very healthy, you know, healthy. Activity, but but sometimes our streets aren't really designed for walking. So we, we tend to have some of the highest pedestrian fatalities all over the country because we we walk. It's, you know, and, and we need to figure that out. This is this is a picture of a typical suburb in the San Gabriel Valley in Los Angeles in, in, in L.A. County. And again, you could tell that when they developed the suburb back in the '60s, it was planned. They weren't really they weren't, they weren't really planned for walking. It was mainly for mainly for cars to drive in. And you can see this woman has you know has you know, it was, it was pushing a, a stroller and her son's pushing a, a shopping cart and they're not using the sidewalk. So it kind of creates a really unhealthy condition. So how do we as planners kind of retrofit, you know, really you know, promote this kind of healthy behavior and, and retrofit infrastructure to really kind of fit their needs? This is one example of Boyle Heights, where, where the city, this community of Boyle Heights uh, in East Los Angeles is uh, bisected by like, far, like three or four freeways. And there's a lot of freeway traffic there, so the, the community asked the city, city DOT, to put in, to put in a stop sign. Well, they said no because there's no, no accidents there. So they did, they did it themselves. They put in a stop sign and they, they painted in this this, this zebra, zebra crossing. This is all painted by the community. And uh, again, it's like people because they want to have a healthy life, and they know they walk. And we need to really give people tools, you know, to make this possible. Again, this is Santee Alley. This is in Los Angeles. This is probably one of the most uh, Probably the most profitable areas in all of LA County retail, probably comparable to Beverly Hills, you know, retail rents. But it's all based on walking. Latinos, walk, you know, these are alleyways. Twenty years ago, these were just alleyways that just had, you know, asphalt, you know, trash, you know, trash dumps, and that's it. But now they're, but now they're a really thriving, you know, pedestrian infrastructure. In fact, you know, here, you know, the the, the pedestrian dollars are so strong that they put all the parking. On top of the buildings, which is really, really rare in LA, but it's, 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 it's a very and people coming from all over LA County, even Mexico, to buy buy goods. Again, this is this is a, this is a supermarket in East Los Angeles, and they realize that a lot of their clients are walking. A lot of their customers are walking there, so instead of having them, you know, push the shopping carts, uh, ba you know, back back to their neighborhoods, they develop these uh, systems where they, you know, if you buy groceries, they'll give you a free ride home. Again, this is a good, good way of kind of looking at walking and kind of promoting it. And again, again, food trucks. Food trucks have been or have been common in LA for a long time, but now they're kind of a, a national trend. A lot of it's kind of looking at the pedestrian mobility environment and how you enhance it. You know, this is a, I like this slide here. This is actually a low rider and, and a cyclist. So you know, you know, twenty when I was a teenager back in the '70s, every young Latino kid they bought a, low, a car, a, bought a car to fix up. Now, now youth today. They're buying bikes, you know, because they can't afford the rent, they can't afford the, the cost, they can't afford the gas, they can't afford the insurance, and you know, in LA, there's too much traffic to go to go driving. So, 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 so low riders are being phased out, but now you have a lot of cyclists. And again, how do we kind of respond to these kind of cultural shifts and how youth and our communities, you know, are moving around? You know, so, so, so like again, like Latinos, you know, they have some of the highest uh, fatalities in LA County. I think in LA County a couple of years ago, Latinos between the ages of 30 and 40 had the highest fatalities. So these are men taking their bikes to work, you know, and they'll jump on the they'll jump on the busy street and just drive over to the to the west side. You know, public transportation, you know, you know, how do we again enhance people you know, using the bus? And uh, you do have a lot of ridership in LA and, and Latinos. And uh, 
Latinos and you know, but but again, a lot of our, a lot of our bus stops don't have any amenities. This is a this is a bus stop in a, in somewhere in our county, and there's nothing there. So again, how do we really kind of create create bus shelters? Because what happens here in LA is that you get you get into these contracts with these advertising companies, and all the advertising companies want to put the bus shelters in the west side where the money is, and and you know and the and the and the and the, and the patrons are on the south side and the east side. Which get very few bus shelters. So we've we've had had a we've had designed our own kind of bus shelters to really you know to help out there. Again, again, uh, street vending. I think you know I think like we, one of the new markets that Latinos have created are street vendors because they, they 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 walk, they bike, they take public transportation. So 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 these vendors respond to their needs. This is the corner of Santa Monica Boulevard and Vermont. And again, you know people are taking the subway here. They're catching buses here. They get hungry. They want to they buy a mango. They buy some water. But again, these bus, these vendors are kind of, kind of uh, responding to to these needs of the, of the, you know, of, of the users. And also, it kind of creates a whole new market for for these businesses. Again, this is a taco truck. This is and when, when I worked at Metro, you know, if I if I worked there after five, I had to go to this taco truck. There's nothing else around there to eat. So again, but, the, but this taco truck is right by the bus bus shelter. So you can see that people use it. Is our, is our food carts really popular all over LA? You sell fruit, and again, you're really transforming the way people are using these sidewalks and streets to make them a lot more walkable and also providing you know healthy healthy foods. So this is a good way to get people thinking about you know kind of combining health, walking, and uh, business. Again, another street vendor in LA selling fruit. You know, again, you, you, using using carts to sell fruit. You know, this is a really common practice. People go up to uh, to, 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 to the Central Valley and pick up fruit and come back down and sell it. Again, you know, so how does that how does that impact urban design? This is a this is a parking lot in the, in the Mercado in East Los Angeles, and again, this is one parking stall that's been turned into a shrine. You know, people go there every day before they go shopping. They, maybe they, they want more money or something, but they go there and they, and they they homage there. But again, you know, as you know, you know, to, to create a healthy environment, we need to think about. All aspects of our health it can be spiritual and also you know, physical, but this is an interesting way people are transforming space. This is during Ciclovia in South LA, and again, how do you enhance this walking environment? Now people are changing the world, you know, by by uh, you know by the environment by having all these material and uh, having put all these, all these uh, items on the sidewalk. You know, this is really transforming what would be a typically auto-oriented street into something a lot more vibrant and more walkable. Again, this is a fence. This is a fence in Boyle. I pick a lease out. Every weekend, it becomes a store, you know, an outside store. Again, you know, there's, you're recycling the spaces that, you know, and how people are using them is really interesting. The use of murals is pretty popular, and how murals are really kind of transforming spaces and, and you know, making people feel a lot more that they belong to these spaces. It's not blank walls. It's not full of It becomes a beautiful place where people belong. This is a Latino man cave. This is an alley in, Boyle, in Pico Lisa where they have, uh, they fix cars and they have a, uh, Sofa there, you know, but this is like their space. That's important. This is this is actually a shrine, you know, on a, you know on, on one of the dead end streets that are formed by all the freeways that cut through Boyle Heights. And again, what they've done, they, they turned into a shrine with, with Lady Guadalupe. And you, you see the no, no parking sign? It's been turned. It's been turned into a cross. So they have they have like impromptu, you know, masses out here on on this dead end street. But again, it's how do you reclaim your mental, physical space of your community to give you that kind of healthy perspective. Zumba is a big, a big thing. You know, a lot of women do Zumba classes, and you know, dancing is really big. This is this is in Boyle Heights at Monarchy Plaza. They had a big dance festival there. You know, it was a, it was a, a, a you know a kind of a, a rockabilly dance festival. But again, dancing and being social is going to get people out there and kind of getting getting more physically active. You know, these are one of the, these are one of the impromptu sites from a couple of years ago in LA, where a lot of a lot of these these, these folks were for, for, uh, for Mayan descent, and they were playing this, this this old Mayan game. On the vacant lot, but the use of vacant lots to make you know make people be more active, you know, is really 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 you know important. And again, this is a soccer field in MacArthur Park. And again, you know, for what's happening in Los Angeles is that all the older inner city neighborhoods, they're parks that were designed for passive recreation. And so this was this was this was designed as a passive park. So these kind of interventions are new, but they're much needed because people there's a lot of uh, kids in these communities. Again, this is a project they worked on uh, a couple of years ago. It's called, it's called the Evergreen Cemetery uh, Jogging Path. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, Boyle Heights has, uh, East LA has seven cemeteries. So you get this really great potentially, potential jogging path. You have, in this, in this case, in Evergreen, you have a mile and a half with only one driveway. 
And that's a miracle in LA to have one drive in a mile and a half stretch. So, so members of the community have always been jogging around there on the sidewalks. So the sidewalk has kind of busted out. So we hired, so, the, so an artist helped us and he designed his logo of a, of a skeleton jogging. And it said, instead, of, instead of saying rest in peace, it says run in peace. So it's become one of the most popular features in, the, in Boyle Heights. People jog here 24 seven. It's a cemetery to jog around. And, and, it's, and it's in the community, it's very active and people just really, really respond to pretty well. Again, you know, you know, how do you, you know, I worked on this campaign a couple of years ago in, in, in L.A. called the, the Cornfield State Park. And again, the, the city wanted to build warehouses in this big, 32 acres of land, you know, in downtown L.A. But again, L.A. is a park poor community, and you have a lot of, lo, lot of low income Latinos that have no access to parks. This is a good way to kind of fight back and say, we need to get a park here and really transform the environment. This is another park we worked on in El Sereno, El, Elephant Hill. We have a lot of hillsides in L.A., that are, that, that, are, that are vacant, but a lot of them have uh, paper streets. They were, they were gridded, out, gridded out 100 years ago, so people are buying and selling these lots on these hillsides, and, but because of technology, people could not build on these hillsides. But now that, the, now that the, now people have more technology to build on hillsides, so they can build 50-foot retaining wall to cut these hills. So we're trying to fight back and protect these hillsides within these low-income neighborhoods to give people more healthier options and how to really you know, move around. This is, this is a South Central farm in L.A. It was 14 acres, 350 families. This is a really, really beautiful place because a lot of Latinos would come here and farm here, and you could see where they came from. You know, if, if you could tell by, by the little garden plots if they were Latinos working in the U.S., you know, or Latinos coming from Mexico and farming because they had two different farming styles. You know, with, with the U.S. trained uh, farm, you know, two U.S. U.S. working, you know, farmers, they would have the rows, like the Central Valley, but the ones in Latin America would have just a bunch of plants growing everywhere. And the whole idea of having having plants grow is really different. But this but this battle was lost. So now we, this is one of the largest farms that we lost a couple of years ago. But again, these are really important for people to have these kind of places to really, you know, really kind of promote their culture and promote healthy living and food. Again, this is this is in Denver. This is an alley in Denver that's been turned into an impromptu playground. You know, they, people there's no playground spaces. So they kind of uh, do it on their own. This is another project in, uh, in Boyle Heights called the Project of Hardeen, where it's been turned into a community garden. Again, you're growing stuff in their front yard. You see, you, you, if you go to Boyle Heights, you'll see a lot of like corn and uh, avocado trees, lemon trees, you know, in their front yard. Yeah, in working places. This is a park in, a, you know, this is a parkway in uh, Plaza de, de, de Las America. This is in, in South LA, where they turn, they turn this big giant uh, median into this, into this active walk, walking street with, with, with equipment, you know, between two streets. This is, this, is, this is the city of San Fernando where we cut money from the metro to turn uh, basically, you know, 12, eight, half an acre into a city of Chavez Transa Plaza, you know, with plants and murals and all these different amenities. You make this kind of healthy space you know, for the community. This is Machu Plaza in Boyle Heights. Again, you know, this, is, this is a donut shop a couple of years ago, but now it's a, now it's a, you know, it's a kiosk for, for the mariachis, and it's become really a landmark you know, in the community where people really now rally around as a place. Uh, swap meet, you know, a lot of old industrial, uh, you know, uh, facilities in LA have been turned turned, turned, into, turned into swap meets, turned into into these big giant mercados that really promote, you know, these kind of shopping habits. This is a place in in, in uh, San Fernando Valley. This is in a uh, Plaza Plaza del Valle. What they, they, they did here, they took it. You know, they had, they had these old storefronts that they couldn't rent out, so they took they took a, a row of parking behind them and made a pedestrian walkway. And, they, and, and, the, and the pedestrian walkway is lined with all those little tiny stores or puestos that they run out. Now they have a really vibrant street, you know, in the middle of San Fernando Valley that really promotes businesses and promotes a really healthy walking lifestyle, what was, what was once a parking lot. You know, they're really chipped. And again, looking at homes and how people, how Latinos really transform their home into a, a special place. Because a lot of Latinos come from Latin America where they have these courtyards and also where they have plazas. So they, so they, they buy a house in the U.S. with their front yard and backyard, and, and it's like, what do, we, what do we do with our front yard? So they change it. They put in, they put in, they put in the porches, and they, put in, and they turn the front yard into a plaza, and you'll see a lot of stuff like this going on there, you know, where the front yard's been changed. You know, and uh, you'll see a porch being added on there, you know, kind of cultural identity with the built environment. And having that control of who you are and how you identify yourself is really important for people to have that kind of sense of place, you know, mentally. You know, and, and taking your, your, your front yard into a more into a, into a more healthier, sustainable place. You know, front yard plazas, you know, waterfalls, and people talk, you know. When I did my research on Boyle, East LA, it was all done to, it was all done over the front gate. 
that's really a healthy place to talk to people at, you know, and really kind of be part of the community and really kind of come together and create the point of interaction. Again, people eat out there in these front yards and uh, have parties in their front yards and even decorate their front yards. You know, the whole idea of how do you decorate, how do you identify yourself in this new country, in this space, make, that makes you feel good. You know, again, these are, and then also looking at, you know, these, how kids play in front yards. These are, this is down in Pico Liso, where people, people uh, skip, kids are skipping rope. This is a, you know, more, this is a playground for chihuahuas and cats, you know, but uh, the front yard. But again, all these front yard amenities. So people are using spaces in very creative ways to kind of get their activity. And kids want this kind of activity, you know, in their, in their, in their communities. This is, this is a nativity scene. And you, during Christmas time, a lot of immigrants will build, build, build these really elaborate nativity scenes as a way, you know, as a way to, you know, showcase their talents, but also get, to get back to the community. Because these are really beautiful, really interesting kind of folk art kind of things. But uh, again, so what happens here is that Latinos are reshaping America's suburbs in very healthy ways just by how they live. And how do we as planners really enhance these kind of, these kind of really positive you know, behavior patterns to really reinforce them rather than say, you know, you can't do this. But uh, that's kind of the work I've been doing. So I think next we'll have a, so again, so Latinos are creating a healthy built environment through you know, come through there, talking with the community and observing their activities, needs, and desires. So it's next we're going to have Rudy talking about street vendors. Or, or, or Miguel, you want How's everybody doing? Are you guys having a good conference? Awesome. Okay, so my name is Rudy Espinoza. I'm the executive director of an organization called Leadership for Urban Renewal Network. Uh, we go by our acronym LEARN, and we're based in Los Angeles and Boyle Heights. Uh, I'm happy to be here to talk about something that's been really important uh, to us for a very long time, actually since the founding of our organization seven years ago, and it's street vendors. Uh, it's, it's a great sort of dovetail off of what James talked about, because I think one of the, uh, the theories that we use at LEARN is that the answers already exist. That when we're thinking about how do we make cities better places to live, they, they already exist somewhere. And the community residents are showing us how to make cities better. It's just up to us to listen and to empower them to, to create policy. So what I'd like to talk to you today is about street vendors. So the next 10, in the next 10 minutes, what I'm gonna talk about is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share why I think street vendors matter. Uh, I'm gonna sh show you a bunch of pictures that sort of depict, at least to me, why street vendors are the ultimate urbanists. And then I'm going to tell you about what's happening in Los Angeles. And some of you, is anybody here from LA? Okay, there's a few people, a lot of people here from LA. Awesome. So there's a lot of things happening uh, regarding street vending in Los Angeles. So I'm going to talk about uh, some policy implications. And, and I'm going to end with some next steps for you all that hopefully you can help me. And then you can also sort of take back to your communities to, to incorporate some policy efforts into the work that you're doing. So why do street vendors matter? There is an estimated, in Los Angeles, there's an estimated 50,000 vendors in, lo, in, in the city. It's a lot. It's about 10 to 15,000 of those vendors are food vendors. The rest of them are selling uh, different types of merchandise. These vendors uh, sell food, and they sell very tasty food and a lot of different things. You see them all over the place. Uh, many of them, uh, as you know, per our observations, are older workers, and many of them um, have a lot of different variety of backgrounds. Some of them are really educated, and others not so much. Um, but we see that a lot of them are older and, and chronically unemployed. We, one of the things when we think about sort of vending, let me go back to this really quick here, um, is that, you know, vendors matter because they contribute so much to our cities, okay? I don't know if I put the stat up here, but one of the things that we discovered is that, uh, that we partnered with some academics and we realized that, uh, that vendors are contributing more than $500 million to the, to the local economy. So we see these entrepreneurs all over the streets, using our streets, building businesses, taking care of their families. Um, but, and they're also generating really t tangible resources for our city. Okay. So when we think about policy, we think, well, can policy and can the work that we're doing as practitioners support these folks? And of course, we think yes. Um, in, in some neighborhoods, street vendors are the sole source of healthy and affordable foods which some people might think, oh, when you think about a street vendor, you think about the, the taquero, you think about the hot dog uh, guy with, the, with, the, with bacon. There's actually a lot of folks that are selling healthy food. And in, in a lot of low-income communities, all you all know that there's a minimal access to grocery stores oftentimes. 
So vendors are often the, the sole place where people get a healthy snack. We also see that street vendors are all helping to attract people to the streets. There's a lot of commercial corridors in Los Angeles, for example, that, you know, they're a little bit slow. There's small businesses there. There's brick and mortar businesses that have been there for a long time, but there's not a lot of pedestrian foot traffic. When street vendors begin to arrive, and sometimes businesses partner with street vendors, we see more pedestrians coming to the streets. And this is something that we try to highlight as much as we can, because oftentimes uh, folks try to pit these type of entrepreneurs against each other, uh, when in fact, oftentimes we see that when they work together, they're providing a more of an attraction um, in our city and bringing more pedestrians to these streets that need more activity. And there's that $504 million uh, stat, and that's from the Economic Roundtable in Los Angeles. Um, it's really amazing because it doesn't even, it, it captures directly what street vendors are contributing to the economy, but it, it doesn't even fully capture all the, the, the economic industry that revolves around street vendors. Uh, for those of you, uh, for those folks that are, uh, that are knowledgeable about food entrepreneurism and mobile vending, it's not only about the individual entrepreneur, it's, it's also about the cart manufacturer and the commissaries and all the different types of industries that revolve around a street vendor. So street, vendor, street vendors are just the, the, are the cornerstone of a big food economy that oftentimes as planners and as community development practitioners, we take for granted. So uh, I'm gonna show you a variety of different pictures that, uh, that I've taken over many years. Uh, this is a, a barbacoa seller on Slauson in South Los Angeles. And this was a, a rail line that's not used. There's no train that goes by there anymore. And this guy is not only selling a barbacoa, but he's basically created a restaurant. And it's always really crowded. And it's amazing to see this space that it's a long stretch of barren wasteland <laughs> in South LA. And this guy is saying, you know what, we need to, we need to mix it up here. And nobody's using it, so I'm going to use it in, 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 a, in a way that's going to activate uh, this, this parcel on the weekends. One of the things uh, for my, uh, my bicycle activist buddies, you know, vendors are so, you know, innovative in the, the way that they get around. And we're seeing a lot of uh, street vendors basically weld these type of bikes so they could put their products on it and get around more easily. It's really fun to see these folks on the street, and, and uh, it's, it's another great example as to how these folks are thinking out, outside the box about how to get around. They're definitely multimodal. You know, street vendors, you know, are really sort of just places where people gather. As I mentioned, this is uh, on the left. There is a, it's a picture from a vendor in Echo Park, and the, the one on the right is a vendor in Boyle Heights. Again, people look forward to seeing them. They often know these vendors personally. On the left, I, I was so happy to capture this picture because this lady sells tamales on the left right there is in Boyle Heights on Whittier Boulevard. Um, Boyle Heights is a neighborhood on the eastern side of Los Angeles. And this lady's there every morning. And it was really cool to see her w interacting with her clients on the sidewalk. That's in front of a, a, a bank. Uh, every morning she's there. And I, I always get upset when people say, though, they're just, you know, they're making our streets all trashy and they're leaving a bunch of stuff. This lady every morning gets her broom out and cleans the street. And when she leaves, she gets her broom out again and she cleans the street. And she's interacting with these neighbors here. They go and patronize her business often. On the right, this is a, a vendor that's near my office in, in Boyle Heights. It sets up every evening. Again, super popular. I haven't tried the tacos yet because he's relatively new. But, you know, he's using this space in an industrial section of Boyle Heights. One of the things that's interesting, again, the healthy food component is just kind of these folks that are kind of like, you know, flipping off the fast food restaurants to a certain extent. Here's a, on the right here is a fruit vendor that's right in front of the Carl's Jr. Here on the left, there's another woman that's, you know, biking around McDonald's. You know, I don't know if they're doing it consciously, but it is really interesting to see, right, as, as observers of, of what's happening in the city. Uh, on the left, uh, I love when I see vendors near transit because that, to me, is indigenous transit-oriented development. These are folks that are saying, hey, you know what? There's going to be people walking around to the train. I'm going to post up right here. This is where the customers are. I want to bring activity. And, and when I see that, it's really an opportunity for us to engage them in everything that we're doing around rail and around transit. If, they, if, if we could say, hey, you know what? People are coming to you. Can you let them know to encourage them to take the train? And if, you're, if we're having a discount on fares, would you let them know because you're here all the time? These are amazing opportunities that, at least in the city of Los Angeles, we're missing. On the right is a, a cool picture of a, of, a, of a cotton candy vendor on the metro. So obviously, they use the train, too. 
Um, on the left, there's a photo of a vendor uh, in between traffic. You know, they're scoping out better than, I'm on the, the city's uh, transportation commission. And so when we think about, tra you know, traffic and, and different things, it's interesting to see these vendors have actually scoped it out better than us sometimes. And this guy, this is in uh, Echo Park. The dude is there every day at traffic peak hours, selling stuff, going in between cars. On the right is a guy in Silver Lake, I believe, uh, near a bike lane. Uh, on the left, uh, this is something super fascinating. Uh, you know, uh, uh, my organization does a lot of work around economic development, and it's really interesting to see. The left is a picture in Highland Park, which is the northeast part of Los Angeles, and this is a vendor. Actually, he hasn't been there in a little while, so I, maybe he got in trouble. But sometimes folks have partnerships with the local businesses. So this is an auto shop. And so I, they have relationships with the business owners. Say, you know what? You're not using it in the evening. Can I rent out your space and, uh, and vend here at night? Happens all the time. It's an amazing use of space in a very dense city. How do we mix it up a little bit? On the right is something that James showed, different, uh, different picture, but the same, same concept here of vans and trucks, you know, peddling fruit. On the left, um, this photo is this man that it, like, obviously knows all the different businesses on the street and is popping in to say hi and maybe sell some cotton candy. Um, and on the right, there's another vendor. This is in South LA. Uh, you know, again, older workers. But you know, I don't know if anybody has read Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point. Um, it, but in the book, he talks about different people that are involved in a community's movement and in, in, in trends. And uh, he describes what he calls our mavens, people in the community that everybody knows that people go to for advice. These are people that as planners, we need to engage more. And then when I see vendors like this, it's like, man, they, they know everybody. We need to incorporate them into the work that we're doing and as, as true urbanists, because they really are, walking and taking transit in the city and also building businesses to take care of their families. Um, on the left is not a street vendor in the traditional sense, the taco truck. Um, but I just loved how they're setting up a table and creating an open air restaurant. On the right, um, I, was, I took this photo and I was interested just kind of in all the different things that the woman was selling, CDs, flowers, and I think she has like some snacks. But behind that, I didn't get a photo, is this um, food truck, and I can't believe I forgot the name, even though I, I eat lunch there all the time, is in South LA, <laughs> it's, on, it's on Vernon, and it's in a parking lot. And what these dudes made, it's, it's, they make the tortillas a mano, it's all handmade tortillas, and they welded like a bar table on the, on, on the gate. So you order your, your burrito, and then you could, you could, you could eat on, on the rail. And it's just really fascinating to see how these folks, per James's presentation, are using the city in different ways. So, you know, that's, you know, a long sort of monologue as to sort of what, why we care about vendors and why we can learn from them, more importantly. Um, but, you know, uh, the, one of the things that, you know, we find is that, unfortunately, not all cities really like them like I do. <laughs> especially in Los Angeles. LA is um, one of the cities that does not permit any form of vending on sidewalks. We show this map to a lot of street vendors that, out of, you know, to show them that out of the 10 major cities in the country, Los Angeles is the only major city that does not permit sidewalk vendors. And people that are not from LA are like, what? I can't believe it. And people that are from LA, they're like, how can you say that, dude? It's, I see them everywhere and I eat from them all the time. And it's, no, it's not true. They are all not illegal. They're all, they're, they are not legal. None of them can get permits. But, you know, new policy can fix this. And, you know, I, I wanted to present this and I appreciate James inviting me to participate because sometimes as planners, as city bureaucrats, we're there and we're like, oh, we're just following the law. We have a, an opportunity to advocate for what we think is best for our communities. And in our case, uh, we've been working with the coalition to fix this situation, okay? So uh, LEARN, my organization, is part of the LA Street Vendor Campaign. It's a citywide effort to create a permit system for sidewalk vendors. It has over 60 different organizations that we've built uh, over, it's been three years now together, uh, this growing family of people that want to fix this situation in the city. Um, I show this, and I'm going to speed through this here so uh, Miguel could come up here and join me, but we show this, uh, this, mo this model to vendors to educate them on what's going on. So if you wanted to start a vending business, you have to con be concerned about two different entities in general. One of them is the health department where you get your food handler's permit and such. They only care about making sure people don't get sick. The city, on the other hand, doesn't care if people are getting sick. They care about whether, where you're selling your food land use. 
unfortunately, that's the piece that's missing in Los Angeles. So there's a lot of vendors that actually go through the health department but, and then they want to sell in the city and then they're confused when they get busted. That's the part that's missing. So well, we, the policy, this is, I'm tell, this is kind of new stuff that's going to be public uh, really soon, um, but this is our policy proposal. We want to create a citywide system for vendors. We want to define reasonable locations where vendors can sell. We want there to be, uh, we want uh, food vendors to be required to get permits from the health department. We want to incentivize healthy food vendors to really bring out those vendors that want to, you know, address a food desert issue. We want responsible enforcement. Enforcement is super important for any program, as all of you know, but we want it to be responsible. Right now, currently, vendors are getting misdemeanors for selling fruit on the street. It's really uh, hampering a lot of folks that maybe want to become citizens or just trying to take care of their families. We want to enforce a really good program, but we want to not penalize folks that maybe make, make a mistake once in a while. And we also want to make sure that our, our program is supported by education and technical assistance through a lot of city programs that already exist. These are entrepreneurs, and they, like many of us, want to have a successful life and take care of our families. So um, this is all a culmination of a lot of research, uh, community engagement across the city, partnerships with scholars and practitioners. These are just pictures from some of our town halls and uh, community meetings. Um, and right now, uh, we've met, we've done so much work. We've met with a bunch of city council offices. A general framework was approved recently through the Economic Development Committee, um, and it's moving forward. Uh, right now, we're monitoring the chief legislative analyst's proposal on how they want to legalize street vending. Um, and uh, public hearings just finished, so the city hosted public hearings across the city on this process. Um, and right now, we're waiting to hear back from uh, city departments who are articulating their vision. Um, how, how, will, how much will it cost? How is it going to be enforced? And things like that. So. Um, I already said this, our communities already have awesome ambassadors. We should just ask them and engage them in our process. Um, these people can really teach us how to best use the city. And, you know, policies, the city should really wrap around these folks and really lift them up. And, and, and sometimes it's really hard work. I mean, the work that we put into this campaign, I mean, in the beginning, people said it could never be done. And now we have a meeting with the mayor on Tuesday. It's going to committee again in, at the end of this month. It's moving forward, and it's in the press, and it's exciting. But it was really because we thought that these people are teaching us how to use the city, and we should help them. And I want to encourage you all in the same way, when you see an issue, you know, ask community members, how, how, what do you guys think about this? Or even just go out, out, of, out of our offices and, and check it out. You know, as James mentioned, people are painting the street when they see that there's a safety hazard. That's amazing. And we should encourage that uh, a ton more. So that's my info, my email, and then I think Miguel is next. Thank you. Hello, everybody. How's everyone doing? Good? Are you enjoying the conference? Yes? Well, it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> now it sounds like it. My name is Miguel Vasquez. I am a planner with the County of Riverside Department of Public Health. And the first thing that I should say is that the health department cares about making sure that people don't get sick but we also care about many other things, including planning. And that is the reason why I'm here. Now, my job today is to make you a little dizzy, and I'm going to accomplish that by using Prezi. Now, I don't have anything to really teach you today. The slides that you are about to see, in my personal view, are full of health since or session today is on Latino urbanism and health. I'd like you to think as I go through the slides, how do you think that health is embedded into the examples that I will, I will show you today? <clears throat> I want to tell you four short stories. I, I'm gonna go quickly with this so that you can hopefully see how Latinos are Influencing urbanism and planning. In planning, there are actually different 
dimensions of planning and how people interact with the profession. So I'd like to bring that to your attention and planners are one layer of that, we're people. James, Rudy, Ramon, who I just met, Vidal, they are part of a dimension of how Latinos are influencing planning. All of you are probably working with a Latino or Latinos live in your community. So think of that. How do you interact with people who consider themselves or label themselves or you view them as Latinos? Think about that. So I work for the County of Riverside Department of Public Health. And for those of you who may not know where Riverside is, there, there it is. Now I want to take you to a place which is called Coachella. Now for those of you who are, for those of you who are tweeting, I have a good tweet for you. There are two Coachellas. There is the Coachella Valley, which is the permanent Coachella. And then you have ephemeral Coachella. Now this is not the Coachella that I want to tell you about. And you should know that the festival actually happens in the city of India, not in the city of Coachella. I want to take you to one of our unincorporated commu communities called Mecca. Is anyone here familiar with Mecca? Yeah? Oh, there you go. Yes, of course. It's very rural, a lot of open space, a lot of agricultural fields. And I want to tell you very quickly the story of Sergio. Sergio is the executive director of Pueblo Unido, which is an organization that has a mission of improving quality of life in mobile home parks. He has recently accomplished a project which intends to improve the quality of life for, uh, for the water quality in mobile home parks. The levels of toxins in water in this particular area are very high, and he, ha he has come up with a system to reduce the cost and provide access to clean water to these mobile home parks. So I would recommend that you Google Pueblo Unido, find out about the project. It's really, really awesome. Sergio Carranza came from El Salvador, and I believe he has a degree in engineering, and that's how he was able to develop this new system, which is called, I believe, reverse osmosis. As a result of his work and his good nature to help people, he has accomplished something that for many traditional planners was not uh, actually uh, something that was possible because of the cost. Okay, now I want to briefly tell you about this project. You probably heard a little bit about it during the awards ceremony. This is a project that is intended to raise awareness around planning with high school students in the Coachella area. Students from three, actually two high schools, one from Coachella Valley High School, the Nova Academy, which is a, an early career college school in Coachella, and students from an after-school program called the Environmental Youth Alliance participated with us, and they learned about what planning is and what planners do in a very basic way, but we were able to engage them to actual projects. In Coachella Valley, there is one main huge project that is going on right now, which is highly controversial. It is called CV Link. I'm not sure if you heard of it, but it's a visionary an expensive project that envisions to create a multi-purpose trail from the city of Palm Springs to the edge of North Shore of the Sultan Sea. It's about 50 miles. So students from the Nova Academy were engaged through a process which we, the Department of Public Health, in partnership with the Coachella Valley Association of Governments, with funding from the Southern California Association of Governments, we developed a health impact assessment for this project. At this time, it is being finalized, 
and the students were able to visit the site and ask questions that some planners hadn't really considered as they were doing their plans, and as a result of that, some of their thinking and opinions were included into the plan. <coughs> I should also mention that one of the key components of the project is to provide an opportunity for students to exercise critical thinking skills. And the best way and easiest way to do it from our, from our point of view is to really give them this model in which pretty much planners and decision makers have to move around meaning considering the environment, society, and economy so that hopefully decisions are made somewhere towards the middle. Not everything is always about the economy or not always about the environment or not always about the people because all of these three forces do play into, at the end of the day, making sure that people are, people's health is protected. Now in Coachella, there is a renaissance going on in terms of art, public art. This wall right here, this is, a, this is downtown Coachella. This is one view of downtown Coachella. And it has gone through a significant redevelopment in the past five years. And one of the things that they've been doing, I think through a very small grant of about $28,000, they've been able to begin a mural program which is really raising awareness and pride about cultural heritage. This mural depicts the Gelaguetza, I think, from Oaxaca. And some of these murals are painted by local artists, and I believe they are part of a, an international collaborative that also brings artists from around the world to paint the walls of Coachella. So Google Walls of Coachella, it's a really cool project. And then you probably heard about our Volops too during the uh, award ceremony. And this is a project that was, that began with the Inland Empire section of MPA and it's intended to raise awareness uh, around planning. In this particular image, you see a family working on a collective map making project. They are drawing the city of Indios downtown plan uh, to a larger scale, and through this process, we were able to tell people about what planning is and what planners do and how they can be part of that process. And lastly, I want to tell you about the biggest hacker in the city of Riverside. Anybody familiar with Riverside? Yes? Uh, oh, yes, yes. Do you, do you know Martin by any chance? His name is Martin Sanchez. And why is he the biggest hacker? Because he had a vision. He has a house downtown Riverside, and he turned his house into a restaurant, which is called Tio's Tacos. Now, in the restaurant business, there is a ton of waste, right? bottles and bottle caps and if you eat if you eat um como se dicen las este, um, oysters you know there's shells right and people just throw them away martin no no he keeps absolutely everything right but you know what he does with all this stuff he decorates his house and his restaurant it is the probably the most unique place aside from the Mission Inn in, in the city of Riverside. Now this shows you the kind of vision that he brings to, to his place. And he can do it because it's his land, right? But can he really do that? No, we have zoning and we have regulations. So he started working pieces by pieces until finally one day, the planning department and code enforcement noticed. This was years and years ago, and they tried to shut him down, but they did not succeed 
And today, Dios Tacos is a major landmark in the city of Riverside. So there, he's, you know, he's kind of like Walt Disney. He, he had a vision. And, and if you go to Riverside, you want to see something, something, if you want, okay, let me, let me see this. So there's Chipotle, right? And Chipotle, it's pretty good. I, I, I eat there, right? But if you want to eat food that is more unique than Chipotle, and you want to have an experience about the place where you eat, please go to Tios Tacos. I, you will not be disappointed. This is a playground. And Steve Preston, didn't we go there, Steve? <laughs> An amazing place. It's a playground for photographers. You see our students from the photography department, they love it. Muy rico, sí, muy sabroso. That's right. So here is the, the Sanchez family, and I'd like to close with a quote that comes from their website. And they say, the Sanchez family proudly migrated from Zaguayo, Michoacán, Mexico. Although they migrated to the United States from, the home, from their homeland, Mexico, the Sanchez family is grateful for the opportunity that America has offered them. Martin Sanchez, the artist, arrived at a very young age. He always aspired to get out of the poverty he was surrounded by in Mexico, just like many others. And this concludes my presentation. I'm looking forward to your conversation. Thank you, James. This is a really great uh, inspirational presentation, but it just shows you the power of imagination. You know, and how, how as we as planners capture this space in our heads that people carry with them. You know, they're coming from Latin America, they're bringing, bringing with them new ways of thinking, new ways of you know, creating space, new ways of identity. And we as planners need to understand that there's a lot more than just a plot plan, an address, a zoning code, but all these values and imagination that, that people that live in people's heads are gonna shape our cities regardless of what we do. We need to really capture that. And, uh, and so it's really interesting to see this kind of on a national level, because 25 years ago when I started looking at East LA, it was East LA, but now I go to Chicago, New York, uh, you know, Boston, Minneapolis, I see the same patterns everywhere. So I think it's really, it's really, it's really shaping this kind of it's new form of uh, urbanism all across the Americas, and it can be really a good way to think about health and sustainability in the suburbs, which people have kind of forgotten now, and kind of because they all want to move into the inner cities. So with that said, I'd like to open up for questions or comments from the audience. We have a couple of minutes. Okay. That's a, good, that's a good question. You know, I think uh, we just think about. As far as the status is concerned, it is ADA compliant. Ramps and bathrooms and everything you need to be able to move on a wheelchair is provided. Believe me, the city is not turning a blind eye on the status. Martin Sanchez has to comply with all the requirements to make sure that no one would, hear, would, would get hurt in his place. Now, in terms of ADA, I think sometimes to be able to allow this type of development, really the planning department has to be open to ways to use creativity and, and imagination, as James mentioned. I think sometimes we are too set into our current ways, and we are unable sometimes to look for different solutions that could actually create places like this that are unique and that people treasure. You know, as, as far as street vending, just on that note, uh, we are very mindful of that. And, you know, some sidewalks are, are very wide in the city of Los Angeles and others are very narrow. And uh, we are proposing uh, vending on sidewalks that, can, that have the capacity to have street vendors and folks can still walk by safely. Or, or pedal by or, or whatever. So that's something we definitely consider. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to add something else to that. And I think the counterpart of that question is what about ADA compliance from the rest of our built environment? You know, there's places with no sidewalks, there's no ramps, 
or people can't really safely walk on the streets that are supposed to be compliant to our codes. So how can we combine our needs in places like this with our existing built environment so that everything that is needed in our community is provided without really excluding some people from having certain things uh, than others? Question. It's actually connected to the, the former, the previous question. Um, we want to make sure that that need can take place on streets where uh, where where folks can still walk by safely, that the public right away is protected. Um, reasonable locations also includes um, near, being nearby businesses. For example, we don't want vendors right directly blocking the, the front door of a small business. Um, so those are all things that are being considered in the in the term reasonable. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes. And if I follow up, how did Yeah, I mean, well, we're proposing that vendors would have to take out uh, liability insurance. Um, so if I wanted to do a special event, for example, um, in public space in the city, that I have to have some sort of an insurance coverage. We've looked into it, and it's actually not that expensive uh, for like a, any annual sort of coverage plan. But we are asking the entrepreneurs that want to use public space have some sort of coverage, which is actually a really interesting opportunity for someone that wants to develop a mission-oriented insurance company to offer insurance for thousands of entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah, let's go. I, I have this question for you. In San Jose, we are having a problem with those street vendors, but especially when you say, you know, they bring all the people to the, all the businesses. You know, these street vendors, sometimes they get closer. The one that gets sell food, for example, closer to a restaurant that has to comply with the ADA, with uh, workers' comp, with the, uh, healthy issues, and you name it. So these street vendors, they come up after five o'clock, but there is no court enforcement at that time, or during the weekends. How are you dealing with those issues in LA, for example? Well, you know, uh, we want to make sure that we're working in conjunction with the health department, and they've been amazing partners. So any food vendor has to have, has to use it, have a restroom within 200 feet of its establishment, for example. And usually, you can use another restaurant but you just have to get a, a letter signed that it's okay to use it. So we're trying to enhance those partnerships and, and hopefully we'll, we'll come up with some solutions. Um, but I think that, you know, I don't want to get away from the problem though that you're, that you're, uh, that you're sort of highlighting. There is, some there is problems sometimes, but we're trying to really hear from businesses and trying to incorporate it into the policy, not use it as an impediment, similar to Miguel's comments of, oh, well, ADA, you can't do it. It's like, well, you can. It's just to be considerate of this other really important piece of our population. In this case, it's small businesses that are really important, too. Yeah, and for example, in San Jose, right on one street, we have six lawsuits from NDA compliance. That those street vendors don't have to deal with them. So that's what maybe, if you permit them, maybe they'll be part of the conversation. <laughs> yeah, in fact, in New York City, they have really strict rules about where vendors can, can and can't go. And they have a whole handbook that people can read. Where, where where they have to be at, with a good tell. I know, for example, all three of you actually. Um, uh, back in Santa Rosa, where I live, uh, I'm part of the steam committee for the Roseland projects. I know you're familiar with the Santa Rosa, but it's, uh, uh, the center is divided in, in quadrants. The 101 freeway going north to south and, and Highway 12 going east to west, and that will make four quadrants. And so three of them are actually Santa Rosa. One of the quadrants is actually unincorporated county. And that's right now in the process of becoming part of Santa Rosa. And so it has different rules. And that area that happens to be the Latino area where we have our food trucks and, and the lady with the tamales, etc., etc. Now when the city takes over, then things are gonna change. But more specifically, there's an area that, that is being, uh, used to be a, a shopping center and a, a bowling alley, etc., etc. The whole place is going to be developed. It's, it's up for grabs, and, and they're waiting right now for developers to come over and, and offer what they can. They want to do, and they, they, they can do. And um, right now, the meetings uh, uh, for the, the town meetings, the people are coming. Uh, of course, it's hard to get the, the town to come over and, and voice the, uh, their opinions. But uh, being in the steering committee, I have 
have a, a, you know, the voice a little bit. But what can I do to get you know some of these things to, to, to show the, the, the value of not completely changing? Because then what's going to happen is going to get gentrified. We change the, the, the fabric of, of you know all your our you know tackle trucks, etc., etc. What, what advice do you have for me? Well, I think I think that with that issue, I think a lot of it is like the work I do is a lot of the stuff that Latinos do. It's all subconscious. We do it automatically, automatic pilot. But you have to be conscious of it. And by be conscious of it, you'll get a street rating ordinance. You know, so, so once you start to codify it, put value to it, then you can start pushing back on it. If people, need to, people need, to, need to know who we are and how we create space. That's it, right? Now you have something to really kind of, now you have something to really, to really, to really kind of talk about. But if you don't talk about it, it's, it's, you can't defend it. So, you know, if you want to use front yards as plazas, call it what it is. That's what it is. You know, but, but you have to be conscious of it and, and raise the awareness of the community. You know, showing them slides like this. Like I, I just gave a tour of East LA to all these Latinos from Denver, because they're, they want to do community plan in Denver and they want to learn from East LA. You know, what Latinos are doing here that we could do in Denver. But again, we need to kind of make this. We need to be conscious of who we are, and how we create space in order to make policy changes and kind of protect them. A couple of points, and then Miguel I think, has a response too. I, I would really partner with folks that can help tell the story, so you're not alone. And I think one of the things that that's why our coalition is so huge. I would immediately probably, if you need to tell a story or get some stats, par partner with a local university and scholars that are looking for projects, something real, like you're offering them. And then second, you touched on a, a little a sort of a tone of gentrification and like displacement. And I think that all of us have to begin thinking about tools to help people own property. Because when you own, you have a little bit more power. And so I think that it's also, again, about who do you partner with that can help you design those tools or perhaps they exist somewhere in your region. I think there's tremendous opportunity by involving individuals who are in the organizing type of work. I think they come from a perspective that really brings the community together. They know how to canvas, do canvassing and phone calls and so on and so forth to bring an issue to the forefront and how to create that story and that message and bring it to City Hall, not only one week, but week after week after week until there is an amount of community involvement and the community really raises to the level that it requires the attention that, that is needed. So from my experience, community organizers are pretty effective in this kind of uh, country question. Yeah, it does happen, and it, you know, I haven't heard about it too much recently, but in the 90s it was huge, and especially yeah. in MacArthur Park in the center of the city. Um, that's another reason that we used to legalize street vending. You know, if I'm a taquero and I'm, and I'm not allowed to be there, and then someone's mistreating me and doing something bad, I'm not gonna call the cops and say, hey, this guy's doing something bad. <laughs> you know? So, you know, we wanna incorporate these folks into the formal economy, and also activate them as eyes on the street. And it's, it's an amazing opportunity that if we don't create systems for these entrepreneurs we're missing out on, these folks are on the street, all that's, that's their business, they know what's happening, and we should empower them and say, hey, you see something that's not right, or someone that's getting beat up, or someone's doing something wrong with you, let's, let's call the authorities and, and remedy the situation. So that's my answer to that. Yeah, I think it's been kind of an issue in uh, East LA. It's funny because uh, you know I worked at Metro for you know, 20, uh, 10 years, 15 years ago, and I worked on the Gold Line project. 
And it was a simple project. We have a, we have a group of people even living on the east side that have very low car ownership. So, so yeah, so we're gonna bring them money to build a rail system. But now it's kind of been kind of reversed. Now it's been, but you know, now, because Latinos have been riding transit for the past, you know, forever in LA, and they're the backbone of the transit system. But now I think, but now, but now non-Latinos are riding transit now in a big number. So that's really kind of, look, uh, kind of really, uh, you're kind of opening up all these other areas to people to move into. And we have a lot of, you know, you're having a lot of gentrification in Boyle Heights, in Highland Park, in Echo Park. But I think for me, it's kind of thinking about, you know, how are these people moving into these neighborhoods, knowing that there's street vendors there, knowing there's mariachis there, knowing there's, knowing there's, you know, and there's murals there, and how do they adopt to the Latino culture, the Latino built environment? Are they going to erase it? Or are they going to keep it? So that's kind of that's going to be the next question: is how they can adopt to it because it's such a strong cultural narrative and the built infrastructure that you just have to adopt to it. You know, you're not going to be this lone person saying, "I hate." You know, I hate tacos in East LA because you just you're gonna have to eat tacos. That's all there is there. You know, it's a, it's a great question. It's something that's super hot topic on the East Side in LA, and there's groups um, that are like, "Don't do any development or any changes to the community because then other people will come." And it's a little weird because I'm like, this community has been marginalized for decades, has poor investment, sidewalks are all jacked up, people can't get to work. It's literally on the other side of the tracks. And so, you know, I think that th these people deserve the best. Um, now, the problem, though, I mean, you're bringing up, sir, is that, you know, folks don't own anything. So, like, they're, they're vulnerable still. So there's an extra step that we have to do in addition to fixing the sidewalks and, you know, bringing in artists to do the, the, amazing, the amazing murals that Miguel showed. It's like we have to take the extra step of making sure that the folks have ownership stake, that they're part of that uh, redevelopment. So it's hard, though. It's, it's a big, heavy lift. Yeah, I think what I'd like to add to that is that I would refrain taking the next step. I would reframe it in terms of actually going backwards, thinking, well, what is it that we need to think and do before we go and do these improvements so that individuals who live in the community are protected or protected in the sense that they can actually benefit from those improvements. So gentrification and displacement is a huge component of that. And one of the tools that is available to planners and public health officials is the health impact assessment, which looks at in <clears throat> the distribution of impacts over entire population, which is not something that planners typically do. They don't really go into that level of, of analysis. Yeah, I think, I think also we have to think about community values, and what do we value as a community in, as a whole? You know, I think that has to be the baseline for how we do our planning, not just property values, but values. Because you see, I see it, I see it all over New York City, everywhere. Everything's changing rapidly, and the values are being eaten away. You know, like one person values this, one person values that. How do we start, how do we start communicating so we have a baseline of values to build our, our, future, community, our future neighborhoods? Yeah, it might be something religious, but also we don't have this graffiti everywhere that, you know, brings down the value of the 
and it's kind of into the question about reasonable location. So the idea is that if there's a healthy vendor that maybe they would be allowed to sell near a school or they would be near a metro stop or a bus stop that they would get that extra hookup because you want to encourage them. But thank you so much for the, the storytelling there, sir, about the, the lighting up the streets and um, doing it better than the city oftentimes. And I think it's, it inspires the work here for us at Learn is that like, that's the reason why we got into this business in, the, in this initiative to begin with is that we started in the 2008 financial crisis when everybody was struggling and then we would go out on the street and we see these people that said, you know what, screw it, I'm gonna try to do it myself. It's like, we, that's America. And we have to figure out ways to encourage that more as, as planners. And yeah, I'm driving down in South LA and it's super dark and scary looking and then there's a vendor that's like, I'm gonna put out some lights because the city's not doing it. I'm gonna do some tables here and some chairs and I'll even put some music if they let me, you know? It's like, it's, it's amazing. I love those slides that you showed about sort of the retrofitting or the influence of the Latin American design on those front yards. Um, have you ever seen a community sort of successfully retrofit and make their codes be updated to match the, the Latino design preferences and the uses of front yards? Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Have you guys seen anything like that? No, it's just, yeah, well, that's our next step is kind of figuring out how to make it put it to code and call the plaza the front yard, <laughs> but that's gonna be uh, interesting. Yeah, that's the next step. The next generation is gonna have to figure that out. It's, it's cause so pervasive now, it's so common. Okay, well, any more questions? Well, well thanks a lot to our panelists for coming over.